all nerds, this is Professor Tracy back with another contracts lesson. This one is a follow-up to our previous two lessons. We did one on offers and the previous lesson was about acceptance and other responses to offers. And so in this one in particular, we're going to look at irrevocable offers. How is it that an offer becomes irrevocable, meaning that it cannot be withdrawn by the offeror, at least for some period of time. Let's jump right in. So remember what we've said about revocation generally, particularly in the last lesson. Our general rule is that an offeror may freely revoke her offer any time prior to acceptance. And obviously there's an exception that we're looking at in this lesson, which is unless the offer has been made irrevocable for some period of time. So if we've got Bob and Barb and Bob says, Barb, I will mow your lawn for $20. Then we have an offer from Bob to Barb to mow her lawn for $20 and how does that work, right? So we've got the offer. And then if Bob says, I revoke, and that occurs before Barb has accepted, then that's a successful revocation, right? And the acceptance would be invalid, right? Because the offer has been terminated when Bob revoked it. So that would terminate not only the offer, but terminate its effect, meaning that it would terminate Barb's power to accept that offer. So the revocation would be effective and the acceptance ineffective. And so we could say, well, what if it unfolded differently? If we've got the offer to mow the lawn, then Barb accepts it and then Bob attempts to revoke. Here, it, barring anything else, that acceptance would be valid and the revocation invalid because Bob has to revoke before the offeree Barb accepts and he didn't do that here. So this would be a failed revocation. So that's a reminder of the general rules about what we said about the ability of an offeror to revoke, but let's look at how one makes an offer irrevocable for a period of time. So we'll see that that can be done. And so for that period of time that it's made irrevocable, that means that the offeror lacks the power to withdraw that offer and that the offeree retains the power to accept within that period of irrevocability. We're gonna focus on four ways that an offer can be made irrevocable. We're going to start by looking at option contracts, then look at how estoppel or promissory estoppel may render an offer irrevocable. And we'll look at irrevocability in the context of unilateral contracts, and then a UCC specific rule known as the firm offer rule. So let's start by looking at option contracts, which will be the one that's going to take us the longest time. Uh, so when we think about an option contract, it's helpful to think of it as being two separate contracts. There is first an underlying contract for which the offeror has made an offer. And then there is the separate sort of ancillary contract that we call an option contract. We're going to start by looking at the underlying contract, which remember, although I'm referring to it as an underlying contract, at this stage in its development, it's really only an offer to create that underlying contract. So let's look at Bob and Barb again. Bob says, Barb, I will sell you my house for $300,000. Well, um, that was unexpected, maybe but I need to think it over. So we've got an offer from Bob to Barb for a sale, right? That he's proposed a bargain to her to sell his house to her for $300,000. But at this stage, all it is is an offer and she said she's got to think it over. So here then we jump to saying, okay, we've got an offer for an underlying contract. What about this? potential option contract. 
So here's how that would unfold. If Bob says to Barb, okay, if you pay me $5, I promise to keep open the offer to sell you the house for the next 30 days. So he's now, Bob has made an offer for this separate contract to keep the offer to the under underlying contract to sell the house open for a period of 30 days. And Barb responds, good idea. That works for me. Here's $5. So then we have her accepting, paying the $5. And so we have offer, we have acceptance, we have consideration. This is a successful or valid option contract. So if we back up and say, well, how does that work? Remember, we have this underlying contract, which is our first contract, but all we have for that is the offer that Bob has made an offer to Barb to sell his house for $300,000. But then we have this second contract, this ancillary side deal, where not only has Bob made an offer, but Barb has accepted. And there's consideration where that is that Bob promises to keep his offer open for that to sell the house to her for $300,000 for a period of 30 days and Barb is promising to pay $5 and indeed already has. So here, how does that work? My beautiful uh, circling there, that it shows you this, that the option contract, remember the subject matter of Bob's promise is that offer for the underlying agreement. And so its effect, the, the effect of the option contract is to keep open the offer that Bob made to sell his house for $300,000, that offer in the underlying agreement for a period of 30 days. And so the legal effect broadly we could state is that the option contract renders the offer in the underlying contract irrevocable for the time period of the option, whatever that is. In our example, it was 30 days. Now, we're going to look at a bunch of different variations here. Let's first look at some straightforward examples, which is let's assume that Bob, the offeror here, tries to revoke within the option period. So we're going to assume, again, we have an underlying contract. Bob's made an offer for that underlying contract to sell his house to Barb for $300,000. Then we have that successful option, which is for 30 days. And so if within that option period, Bob tries to revoke that underlying offer to sell the house to Barb for $300,000, it's going to fail. That's a failed revocation because the option contract forbids him from revoking because he has waived his right to revoke for a period of 30 days. That's the consideration that he's giving to Barb in exchange for the $5. And remember, you may go, well, $5 is nominal, but there's an exception to our nominal consideration rule, which is in the context of an option contract, it's okay, it's fine to have nominal consideration. So let's keep going. Let's assume that Barb tries to accept within this 30-day option period. Again, we've got Bob's offer for the underlying agreement. We have a successful option contract. And then Barb attempts to accept within the option period. Assuming nothing else has gone awry here, that's fine, right? That's going to be successful because they, the option has kept the offer alive. There's been no, uh, you know, anything else that's happened to it. She's accepted during the option period. That's a successful acceptance of the underlying offer to buy the house for $300,000. So what if she tries to accept after the option period has run, that 30-day period. Again, assume we have the underlying contract for which Bob has made an offer. Bob and Barb have entered into an option contract. It's a successful option contract to which remember that Bob has waived his right to revoke that offer for the underlying contract for a period of 30 days. Let's assume now that that 30 days is run, it's passed, and then Barb attempts to accept 
after that option period has run. The thing to remember here is what we said in the previous lesson about laps. That if there's a time period specified for the life of the offer, then it's going to lapse after 30 days. So after that option period has run, the 30-day option period has run, the offer here has lapsed and Barb cannot accept it because the offer has terminated, it's lapsed after the 30 days, so her power to accept was terminated when the when that 30 day period ran that is that that was the end of that offer for the underlying agreement so the offer lapsed so here let's consider a variation on this so we're picking back up, remember where Bob had offered to sell his house to Barb for $300,000 and she said, I need to think it over. And this time, this is key, focus on what he's saying here. She says, okay, I promise to keep open my offer to sell you the house for the next 30 days. And so he's made a promise, but here, instead of proposing an exchange, he's just made a naked or gratuitous promise to keep it open for 30 days. And Barb's just says, perfect, thank you. So is there anything coming the other way? Is there consideration for his promise? No, I spoiled it. I said it was gratuitous, it's naked. So there's nothing there. It's just a gratuitous promise there's not a successful option contract. It's an unsuccessful option contract. That's the setup to these next couple hypotheticals, which is let's assume we've got an unsuccessful option and Bob is trying to revoke within this 30 days that he's promised he's gonna keep it alive. Still remember he's made an offer to sell his house for $300 to Barb, that's the underlying contract, but there's an unsuccessful option contract, meaning that it's just a gratuitous promise. And remember that a gratuitous promise is not legally enforceable. It's not supported by consideration. So Bob isn't bound by it. This, this option contract has, is, as it's labeled, unsuccessful. It has no legal effect. So when Bob tries to revoke within that 30 day period, it's going to be successful because there was nothing about his promise that legally bound him. So it's a successful revocation. Well, what if Barb tries to accept within that 30 day window and we have an unsuccessful option contract? Well, let's play it out. We've still got Bob's offer for this to sell his house. That's the offer for the underlying contract. Then we've got this unsuccessful option contract, meaning that there's just a gratuitous promise from Bob, unsupported by consideration. It's not something that's legally binding or enforceable. And then Barb tries to accept within that 30-day window. Here's the thing to know. Just because Bob could have revoked it, his offer, because he wasn't bound, he wasn't required to keep his offer open for 30 days, but in this hypothetical, he didn't revoke it. He didn't revoke it. And so the offer was still alive when she accepted. So it would be a valid acceptance. Just because he could have revoked it doesn't mean he had to revoke it. It's just, So remember, the unsuccessful option contract simply means he retained the power to revoke. He could have done that anytime prior to Barb accepting, but he didn't. And so Barb could accept it within that 30 day window. Well, what if she waited until after the 30 days? And this one is really, really important to focus on because again, we're assuming an unsuccessful option contract. We got Bob's offer for the underlying contract to sell the house to Barb for $300,000. We have an unsuccessful option contract, meaning that all we have is a naked or gratuitous promise from Bob, which is unsupported by any consideration. He is free to revoke his offer. Again, not required, but he's free to do so. What happens if the 30 days runs? It passes and then Barb comes back and says, I accept. Here's the key. Bob could have revoked that. He didn't. He didn't. And 
And so, but here, remember, it's an unsuccessful option contract. He could have revoked it. He didn't, he didn't do so. And, but nonetheless, if the 30 days has run, then the offer is going to lapse. That 30 days is still going to be treated as the specified time period for the life of the offer. So it's going to die at the end of that 30 days. So the acceptance wouldn't be effective because it's after the 30 days has run. So it's a failed acceptance because the offer lapsed. So what happens now, let's look at another wrinkle, which is what if Barb makes a counteroffer within the option period? And now it's key to understand we've got a successful option contract here, okay? It's a successful option, so it's live, it's legally effective, it's keeping the offer for the underlying contract alive. So Bob's offer to sell his house to Barb for $300,000. So it's keeping that offer alive if Barb makes a counteroffer, as is described here, where she says, I will buy the house for 275000 not 300000 we know that's a counteroffer, and the normal effect of a counteroffer is twofold, we said. And we said that in the last lesson, right? It does two things. It's a rejection of the original offer, and it's a new offer such that the parties change their roles. So Barb would be the new offeror and Bob would be the offeree. But here, because this is within the 30-day window, right? We said this is a counteroffer within the 30-day window, within the option period, it's not going to function as a counteroffer, meaning that it won't kill the offer that Bob has made. It's not going because the option is keeping it alive. So let's continue the story here. Let's assume that the option period was still within that 30 days and Barb, after she made that supposed counteroffer, which doesn't work as a counteroffer because the option's keeping the offer for the underlying contract alive, what, what happens here if she goes back and says, I want to accept it and buy the house for 300,000? It would be effective because remember the counteroffer doesn't act like a counteroffer here essentially it acts like a mere inquiry that if they wanted to scrap everything and go back to you know say well okay fine we'll do it for 275,000 then they bob would have to they would have to agree to get rid of the option contract get rid of the under get rid of the offer for the underlying contract and you know, redo everything. Well, that's not what happened here. She made an attempted counteroffer. It doesn't act as a counteroffer. We said, nope, it doesn't have that effect. So the offer for the underlying contract is still alive. And if she accepts within that 30 day window that she can accept it because that offer for the underlying contract would still be alive. So it would be an effective acceptance. So what happens if she tries to reject within the option period? It would be the same thing, right? It's just that because a counteroffer is both a rejection and a new offer, well, it's not going to function any different if what she were to say is not just, I'll take it for you know 275000 for less money, but just says, no, thank you, I'm not interested. That would ordinarily be a rejection, but because of the option, it doesn't kill the original offer for the underlying agreement. So if we continue the story and she, still within the option period, comes back and says, I accept the offer for the underlying contract to buy his house for $300,000, that's going to be successful because it, the rejection, the attempted rejection within the option period does not kill the offer because the option's keeping it alive. And so if she's accepting within that 30 day option period, it would be an acceptance. And remember anything after the 30 day option period would have to be a new offer because the original offer would have lapsed after the 30 days had run. So her acceptance here would be successful just like it was with the counter offer. 
So what about the mailbox rule? And this is something we touched on in the last lesson, but just to remind you about how the mailbox rule interaction interacts with option contracts. So remember what the mailbox rule says. It says that when an offeree mails her acceptance that it's legally effective on dispatch, meaning when it's put into the mail. Now, remember the default rule for an acceptance is that it's effective upon notice to the offeror. The mailbox rule functions as an exception. It says, no, it's not effective when the offeror has notice. It's effective when it's put in the mailbox, when it's dispatched. Um, and so when we look at this though, it's important to understand, well, how does that interact with an option contract? And we said this last lesson, but let's drive the point home. Let's assume we've got the underlying contract. So Bob's made his offer for this underlying contract to sell his house for $300,000. We have a successful option contract that's keeping alive that offer for the underlying contract for 30 days, keeping it open, keeping it alive. And here, Barb mails her acceptance back to Bob. Now, the key thing is this. We said the mailbox rule doesn't apply when we have an option contract, a successful or valid option contract. So what does that mean? It means if Bob receives Barb's acceptance within the option period of 30 days, it's successful, right? It's successful if it's within the 30 day app, but he must receive it because we said the mailbox rule doesn't apply. So we go back to the default rule, which is that the acceptance is effective upon notice to the offeror, meaning when Bob receives it. So if he receives it within the option period, it's effective and if it's after the 30 days, right, after the option period, then it's not effective, right? It's ineffective because at that point, the offer has lapsed. So that's how we would treat it because remember, if you have an option contract, that's an ex that is, it says, it, even though we're, the offeree is mailing the acceptance, the mailbox rule doesn't apply. We go back to our default rule, which is that the acceptance is effective upon notice to the offeror. So that's option contracts. I know that's a lot of nitpicky things. I think the other, uh, the other ways or methods of making an offer irrevocable are a lot quicker for us to run through. So let's look at promissory estoppel here. Bob's reading a letter. Please assemble and submit your bids for the construction of the new school building by Friday, November 20th. Sincerely, Local County Public Schools. So Bob's approaching Bo. Bo, I'm putting together a bid for the new school building. Are you up for doing the electrical work? Absolutely. Me and my crew can do the electrical work for 7500 Perfect. I'll include it with that your number in the bid. So he said, here's my offer. I will do the electrical work for $7,500. That's Bo's offer here. So Bob takes that bid or offer from Bo to do the electrical work for $7,500. He uses that in calculating his own offer or bid on the bigger job, right? So if you think about it here, it, it, the, uh, the idea here is that Bob is the general contractor putting together his bid on the school job and he's relying on Bo's bid for the electrical work, Bo being one of the subcontractors, the electrician, to do the electrical work for 7,500. So he's relying on that number in order to assemble his bid for the job. And so if he comes back later and says, Bob, I revoked my offer to do the electrical work. 7,500 is not nearly enough to have to deal with you. So you might think of this and go, well, why isn't that effective? Because technically, Bob hasn't accepted Bo's offer to do the electrical work yet, right? If we think about it, he made an offer. It wasn't yet accepted. Bob simply used it in assembling his bid for the school job, but he hadn't accepted it yet. 
But the way this works in the context particularly of a general contractor and a subcontractor, when we have this kind of reliance, we use estoppel or promissory estoppel to estop Bo from revoking. So Bob's reliance on Bo's offer to do the electrical work for 7,500 means that Bo is stopped from revoking his offer for a reasonable period of time in order for Bob to hear back from the local county school board to find out, has he gotten the job? If he has, he, need, he has time to get back to Bo and accept that offer to do the electrical work for 7,500. So it's not that it's only can be used, that estoppel can only be used in this context of a general contractor and a subcontractor, but this is a, a, uh, a variation or a, I should say a scenario where it frequently could come up, where you have someone relying on an offer to their detriment, such that we would say that the offeror here, Bob, or excuse me, Bo, is stopped from revoking it for a period of time in order for Bob to find out whether he got the job and then to get back to Bo to accept it. So Bo would not be able to revoke. So it'd be a failed revocation. I should have had something there saying failed revocation, but it's a failed revocation. So what about unilateral contracts? Remember what we mean by unilateral contracts that an offer for a unilateral contract can only be accepted through the full performance of the offeree. And so it doesn't form to the offeree completes performance. And part of why we call it unilateral is that when it forms, it's only executory, meaning that there's only one party who needs to perform. It's only on one side, that of the offeror. So let's see how that unfolds. That if we use this default rule, remember the default rule is the one we looked at at the top of the lesson, which is that an offeror is free to revoke any time prior to acceptance, but it works in injustice, particularly in this context of a unilateral contract. So let's look in here at Bob and Barb. Bob says, Barb, if you walk across the Brooklyn Bridge, I will pay you $100. Really, Bob? Like, I've never heard that one before. I know, I know, but I'm serious. Sigh. Okay, Bob, whatever you say. Barb walks halfway over the bridge. I revoke Barb. Successful revocation because she hasn't yet accepted. At least if we set aside restatement second of contract section 45, then the default rule applies, which is that an offeror is free to revoke her offer anytime prior to acceptance. And in this context, Barb would not have successfully accepted Bob's offer till she walked all the way across the bridge. And so Bob was revoking prior to Barb accepting. But that's without, without restatement second of contract section 45. And so here, he's, Bob's whistling to himself, Ugh, why do I trust you? So we see the injustice there, right? Because the offeror can wait until the offeree is not only halfway, but could be like 99.9% .9 done with the job and then revoke. That's obviously an injustice, which is why restatement second of contract section 45 developed to address the injustice of that. So let's see what the restatement solution is. So picking back up again, Barb, if you walk across the Brooklyn Bridge, I will pay you $100. You're going to try that one again, huh? Well, I'm ready for you this time, Buster. Oh, yeah, sure you are. You'll see. You'll see. 
Barb walks halfway over the bridge. Barb, I revoke. Revocation fail. Why? Because restatement second of contract section 45 saves the day. How does that work? There, finished. Hand over the cash, my friend. Um, no. I revoked before you accepted. So from Bob's perspective, he's thinking the default rule controls, right? That I can revoke any time prior to you accepting. It was an offer for a unilateral contract. It's not accepted till you complete your performance. You hadn't completed. You were only halfway across. Of course, I could revoke. But restatement second of contract section 45 says what? Ah, uh, contraire, Mr. Contracts. Restatement section 45 prevents you from revoking once I've begun performance. So here's what it does before we look at the limitations of it. Here's what it does. It says that, that the offeror's offer for a unilateral contract is irrevocable for a reasonable period of time in order to give the offeree time to complete performance. So once Barb began performance, then by operation of law, Bob's offer became irrevocable for a reasonable period of time to give Barb time to complete her performance. If she had dawdled or something, then it it would become irrevocable, or it would become, excuse me, not irrevocable, but revocable again, and then Bar Bob could revoke. But here, there's no indication she was dawdling along, but she took the time she needed, and it, Bob could not have revoked because restatement section 45 says that with an offer for a unilateral contract, once the offeree has begun performance, the offer for the unilateral contract becomes irrevocable for a reasonable period of time to give the offeree time to complete performance. There are, however, some limitations to this. So one is, remember, it only applies to the offers for unilateral contracts. And I'm specifically saying that because if you think back to the last lesson that was about acceptance and other responses to an offer, we looked at this chart or built out this chart that said sometimes the manner or the method of acceptance is not specified in the offer and that an offeree can decide, well, maybe I'll accept either, they can decide, right? I'll decide to accept by return promise or by return performance. They can decide, but we said in that context, when it's unspecified, we default to bilateral. And so if the offeree decides they will accept by return performance where the manner is unspecified, we said that their beginning of performance is deemed to be a promise. It's their conduct is treated as a, the return promise and the contract is created at that point. There's a bilateral agreement. So this would, section 45 wouldn't apply. The only time restatement section 45 applies is when the offer is clearly for a unilateral contract meaning that the only way the offeree can accept is through a return performance, a completed return performance. And keep in mind that it's only the offeror that is bound. And what that, why that's important to highlight is this, is that Bob couldn't revoke for a reasonable period of time once Barb the offeree began her performance. However, Barb could have quit. Remember, she has no legal liability until she accepts because she hasn't accepted the offer. There's no bound legally enforceable agreement between Bob and Barb until she completes her performance. It's only the offeror Bob who was now bound in the sense, not that he was stuck in a contract already, but that he couldn't revoke his offer for a reasonable period of time in order to give Barb time to complete. But Barb could have still quit and she wouldn't have had any liability whatsoever.
So it only, section 45 protects the offeree from the offeror waiting to the last minute or till a sizable chunk of the job is done and then revoking. That's its function. It doesn't prevent the offeree from quitting and walking away without liability. So the other thing we always need to be careful about is when does this kick in, right? When does this rule section 45 kick in? Well, it requires that the offeree have begun the actual performance. And so there's this key where we need to ask, well, is what the offeree is doing right now mere preparation for doing the requested performance or has the offeree actually begun the requested performance? Because it's only once the request to performance has begun that this is triggered and the offeror is prevented from revoking. So let's think of an example. Suppose I were to say to you, if you wash my car on Saturday morning at 9 a.m., I will pay you $30. But the only way you can accept my offer is to wash my car in total. And let's say you go out before 9 a.m., you run to the local Walmart and buy the supplies you need. It's quite possible that a court would say, well, that's not the requested performance. You haven't begun yet. So if I call you while you're at the Walmart and revoke my offer, it's likely I could do that because that's mere preparation. You're preparing to do the request to performance, but you haven't started the request to performance. It's not till you get there and you start watching my car that you have begun performance in section 45 kicks in and I would be prevented from revoking my offer for a reasonable period of time to give you time to complete your performance to accept my offer. So we need to be careful to distinguish between mere preparation by the offeree and when is it that the offeree has actually begun the request to performance such that section 45 kicks in. So that's unilateral contracts and how section 45 may make an offer for a unilateral contract irrevocable. And then let's look at the firm offer rule. The first thing to know is, as it suggested back here, is it only applies to the UCC. So it must be a contract for the sale of goods. We're talking about an offer for the sale of goods. So here Bob says that I'm selling oranges, which are goods. And it must be that the offeror is a merchant. So we know that a merchant is what? There's someone who deals in goods of the kind, or they have some level of expertise about the goods. They could be, remember that deals in goods of the kind doesn't just mean they sell them. It could mean that they regularly buy them um, or just regularly deal with them, but they have expertise or they otherwise regularly deal with the goods in question. And here Bob says that I'm a farmer who regularly sells oranges. Therefore, I'm a merchant. So he deals in goods of the kind. He has expertise about oranges. He's a merchant according to the definition of the UCC. So the offer, remember what we're saying is, what are the requirements to fall within the UCC's firm offer rule? The offer must be in writing. So the offeror has to put it in writing. So here, Bob is writing out his offer. Dear Herman, I will sell you 15 crates of oranges for $200. I promise to keep my offer open for the next 10 days. Love, Bob. My offer is in writing. So Bob satisfied that requirement, right? It's in writing. So we know that he's a, he is selling goods. He's a merchant. He's put his offer in writing. The other thing is it must be signed by the offeror. Signed by the offeror. So here, Bob says, I'm the offeror. And I signed right here. Remember, the offeror is the party that's making the offer. And so here, Bob has made his, he's making an offer to Herman and he's signed as he's pointing out to us. And 
there's a three month limit, which we'll unpack more in a second, meaning that no matter what, that, that a firm offer will never last more than three months. Now here, Bob points out, I promised only 10 days. So he's circled in the writing for us. He says, I'll keep my offer open for the next 10 days. So we know, well, that's obviously less than three months. So the, the other key thing to know is that unlike an option contract, which requires consideration, and the example we looked at over and over again was Barb promising to pay $5 to Bob to keep open his offer to sell her the house for $300,000 to keep that alive for 30 days. There was consideration. That was an option contract. But unlike an option contract, we don't need that when we have the firm offer rule. No consideration is needed. So here, Bob says, Herman hasn't paid me a dime yet. I'm still stuck. So he, what he means there is he's still bound by this because he's selling goods, he's a merchant, he deals in goods of the kind, he's put his offer in writing, he has signed that offer, and it's open for less than three months, which will, again, we'll unpack that more because there's some nuance there, but it, and there's no consideration, but that doesn't matter because the UCC's firm offer rule doesn't care whether or not there's consideration. We don't need it for it to be effective. In other words, in order for it to prevent Bob from evoking his offer for that period of 10 days that he's promised to keep it open. So the next day after he's written the letter, he shows up to Herman and he goes, Herman, I revoked my offer to sell you the 15 crates of oranges. Um, no, you can't do that, Bob. And Herman would be right in this case, right? Because the firm offer is binding him to keep the offer open for the period of time that he stated, which was 10 days. So he's stuck. It's a failed revocation. And so the basics of the firm offer aren't that difficult. It's something of a lengthy checklist, but let's focus in on the nuance or the caveats as I've called them which is, okay, what if it doesn't specify a time period? There's a couple things to know here, um, which is if there's no time period specified in the firm offer, then the UCC says if there's language promising to keep the offer open, but it doesn't say for 10 days or 30 days or a week or two days or six hours or whatever, then it's for a reasonable time. And that may irk you because contract law, whether the common law or the UCC, often has phrases like for a reasonable time or a reasonable price. And you're like, well, what is that? It's only lawyers who think that's actually specific. Which we mean by that is let's look at all the surrounding facts and circumstances and that will tell us what is a reasonable period of time to say. We still need language in the firm offer that indicates the offeror's intent to hold the offer open for some period of time. But if it doesn't specify, we say it's a reasonable time. And what, what that's going to turn on is, well, are there facts and circumstances that suggest that uh, the offeror is in a hurry, needs to hear back quickly, or maybe the nature of the goods themselves, like here with oranges, they're produce, so they're not going to last as long as something like if, if I'm selling you jumbo jets, well, obviously a reasonable period of time would be longer there. They don't spoil like uh, something like oranges. Or if we have something, for instance, where the price varies a lot, like uh, we're selling oil. Well, if you look at the price of oil, it goes up and down all day. And so an offer to buy and sell oil is only going to be good for a very, very brief period of time. So what's reasonable is going to depend on the nature of the goods in question. Also sort of what is it, can we tell what, what are the parties thinking? Are there other are there other offerees in the offing? What is, you know, what are kind of speed are they looking to close this deal in? Those kinds of things will indicate to us what is reasonable under the circumstances. 
Also, it's never more than three months. And here we need to be very careful. So if it's a reasonable time, well, that period of time will never be more than three months. It's capped at three months. The other thing to know is if the firm offer specifies a period of time over three months, say it says this offer is good for six months. Well, it's not that the firm offer rule doesn't apply or doesn't work. It does, but we cap it at three months. We say, well, it's open. The, the firm offer rule applies, but it's not, the offer is not open for six months. It's op, it's open only for three months. So it's, we're always capping it at three months. So it's never more than that. It certainly could be less, whether it's a specified time period of less or a reasonable time period of less. So the other thing to know is just because the UCC has the firm offer rule, it doesn't mean that the parties couldn't use an option contract. They could, but they would need to follow all the rules of an option contract, which includes the need for some form of consideration. And you might say, well, why would they do that? Well, because A, they're not capped at three months anymore and none of the other rules about the firm offer required. For instance, that you don't have to be a merchant for it to apply. But the option contract still a vehicle that the parties could use to keep the offeror's offer alive and irrevocable for a period of time. So don't think that they're mutually exclusive, that the UCC allows both, but because the rules for an option contract are the same, whether we're under the common law or the UCC, there aren't any specific provisions in the UCC about them because they're the same. Remember, it's only where the rules differ that Article 2 of the UCC is going to speak, right? Which is why the firm offer rules there. It exists under the UCC. It doesn't exist in the common law. So those are the caveats. I hope you're doing well, that your studying's going well. I know we're pressing toward the end of this fall semester. Uh, I wish you all the best. And as always, if you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, I look forward to working with you more and for more lessons to be on the way. I'll be back soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.